This is C-SPAN's Lectures in History podcast. This week, Emory University professor Felix Harcourt teaches a class on how conspiracy theories about UFOs have shaped American culture and how public opinion about extraterrestrials from the late 1940s through the course of the 20th century has often paralleled societal anxieties. Let's start with a question that I'm sure nobody will have uh, any problem having their answer recorded for television for. Show of hands, how many people believe alien life exists? Yeah, pretty decent number of people. I'm going to throw in there as well. I think so. Stephen Hawking thinks so. In a giant universe, there is distinctly a probability that somewhere alien life has evolved and, uh, you know, probably looks pretty different from us, but it might be out there. Slightly different question. How many of us believe that aliens have visited Earth? Sergio, the only man with the strength of his convictions. I appreciate that. Um, So here's a question. Is the idea that aliens have visited Earth in and of itself a conspiracy theory? Sergio? I don't believe so. No? Why not? Well, I mean, if you take into uh, consideration the fact that we're trying to go to Mars, we would technically be alien life there. So Mm -hmm. the fact that... Another life form, say, that has become intelligent enough to do space travel, visits another planet, isn't really a conspiracy theory. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it seems fair. I mean, I guess it depends on how you define the scope of, like, a conspiracy theory, because it's, it takes an entire species more or less collaborating together to, to land themselves on another planet, so is an entire race working together considered a conspiracy? Mm-hmm. I wouldn't yeah. really think so. Yeah, it seems reasonable, right? It seems a little odd to indict the entire planet of wherever for wanting to come and visit. Um, And even if we are going to say arguably maybe we could consider it a conspiracy theory, it's a conspiracy of aliens in and of themselves, right? Which is not what we tend to talk about when we talk about UFO conspiracy theories, when we talk about alien conspiracy theories. Those are theories that include an element of human complicity, uh, usually of government complicity. And these ideas that there are not only aliens visiting Earth, but that the state is in some way involved with those visits, is a really prominent conspiracy theory. It's not really one conspiracy, it's a multitude of conspiracy theories. like uh, the Kennedy conspiracism that we were talking about last week, to just stand here and name every UFO conspiracy theory would take much longer than we have in this class. Right? So tragically, we will not be talking about the fact that NASA is hiding the existence of the planet Nibiru. Tragically, we will not be talking about the fact that we are in secret contact with Andromeda and uh, part of a vast intergalactic war. And tragically, we will not be talking about the fact that the Earth is hollow and is filled with interstellar beings who may or may not have been allied with the Nazis in World War II, depending on who you ask. And I see a couple of kind of smiles at those ideas, right? which is understandable. But these are real ideas that real people fiercely and fully believe in. And we should be clear, before we dig into this too much, as Bridget Brown makes clear in that reading that you did for today, not everybody who believes in UFOs believes in UFO conspiracy theories. And even amongst those who do believe in UFO conspiracy theories, there is a wide variation, right? We keep coming back to this idea of a fringe conspiracism and a center conspiracism, and that's very much evident within these UFO conspiracy theories. But it's worth thinking about that these UFO conspiracy theories are widely treated as something laughable. In fact, serious discussion of them is really an effective cultural taboo. We've talked about the labeling of something as conspiracy, as a distancing measure. 
alien conspiracy theories are possibly uh, one of the most evident examples of the distancing of conspiracist belief from acceptable discourse. And yet at the same time, even as they're treated as laughable, as risable, they're some of the most widely believed conspiracy theories. And if we go back to the 60s, Gallup polls find 96% of Americans had heard of UFOs, 46% believed that they were real. 1973, 57% believe that UFOs are real. By the 90s, 71% believe the government is at least hiding information about UFOs. They may or may not be real, but there's definitely more going on there than the government is letting us know. And those numbers remain relatively stable. Um, a 2015 Ipsos poll showed that 56% believed that UFOs are real. 45% believe that aliens have actually landed and visited Earth on top of that. To put that in context, 56% right, believe UFOs are real. In that same survey, 57% said that the Big Bang Theory was real. This is very much a widely held belief that is very mainstream, at least the idea that something is going on with UFOs. Even if we narrow it in to a specific example, like Roswell, a majority of Americans will repeatedly say that they are at the very least unsure whether or not a flying saucer crashed in Roswell, New Mexico. And so we have this odd disconnect right, between this very, very mainstream idea, this majority idea, and yet the way that it's treated within our political and cultural discourse. It's also not an idea that's new at all. The idea that weird lights or objects in the sky is something to be concerned about is nothing new. But then if you are a serf in 13th century Europe, what are you going to think that floating lights in the sky might be? Is it going to be aliens? Witches. Witches? Omen of doom. Omens of doom. Any other guesses? God. God, right? God, devils, uh, witches omens, overwhelmingly a supernatural explanation. And it's not really until we start to see that kind of enlightenment rationalism supplant these ideas of divine providence that we move from kind of supernatural to scientific explanations for these unexplained phenomena. Um, although even then, we need to be careful about drawing too wide of a divide between those two. Uh, as we're going to see, the two ideas, the supernatural and the scientific, are going to remain pretty thoroughly intertwined. Matthew? I just want, we've got 11% uh, of people here who think UFOs are real, but don't think aliens have visited Earth. And I was wondering, you know, a UFO is just an unidentified flying object. Mm -hmm. Like, where, where's the boundary there? Unidentified according to who? Like, there are a lot of things I can't identify mm -hmm. in the sky, but I assume somebody can. <laughs> this is true. This is true. Um, yeah, the Ipsos polls, the wording isn't great. The way that the Ipsos poll explains that is uh, not that there's an 11% difference between those who believe UFOs are an extraterrestrial uh, phenomenon, right? What gets... Uh, commonly referred to as the extraterrestrial hypothesis, that UFOs are real and are um, alien-related. The 11% difference is 56% believe UFOs are real, 11% uh, fewer believe that some of those UFOs have landed and that we have had contact with the aliens. Um, that's, that's the differential that's playing out there. The differential between 
something else going on, right? Is that 56 going up to 71% from the 90s, the idea that there is something going on with this question. And that idea that there is something going on has a long history, right? This uh, concern over extraterrestrial contact has a long history. If we go back to 1835, the New York newspaper, The Sun, garners major attention in reporting that an astronomer has found life on the moon. Um, life in the shape of a series of humanoid bat people. Um, turns out, unsurprisingly, that it's a hoax. Um, I'm sorry to disappoint anybody who's hoping that bat people are really living on the moon. But it points us to the ideas that are already percolating around in the 19th century. That gets really evident in the late 19th century. Um, in 1891, when Thomas Blott alleges that a man from Mars appeared in the kitchen of his rural home and fully endorsed late 19th century democratic uh, socialist utopianism, um, which was nice for Thomas Blott to hear, since he was already a believer in such things. Or, in 1896, 1897, where you see a series of unexplained airships seen in the skies over the west coast. Um, and there's a really interesting variety of stories that come out about these airships. Uh, some of them claim that they see humanoid beings inside pedaling to make it go. Um, which, if that is a spaceship, that is a lot of pedaling. Um, some allegedly call out to the airship as it goes over, and the airship calls back down to say that they are from Mars. Right? Even in the 19th century, people are very fixated on the idea of life on, from Mars. But there's these ideas, right? That there is this long history, this long concern about contact with extraterrestrial life, and extraterrestrial life visiting us here on Earth. But when we talk about modern UFO conspiracism, what we're really talking about is the post-World War II era. Um, and these conspiracies paint an alternative history of America from the Cold War to the present. What we might call uh, ethno-sociologies of extraterrestrial conspiracism that reflect very terrestrial concerns about agency, about state power, about disempowerment and depersonalization, about ideas of expertise and authority, and especially of ideas of skepticism about expertise and authority, and about narratives of progress, whether social or scientific. And that modern UFO phenomenon really gets kick-started um, after World War II in 1947 uh, by this gentleman, Kenneth Arnold. People had seen, pilots had seen, unidentified phenomena during World War II. Um, they get commonly referred to as Foo Fighters, which is actually where the band's name comes from. But it's not until uh, Kenneth Arnold's sighting in late June of 1947 of what he describes to newspapers as flying discs, what gets widely reported as flying saucers, that the modern UFO phenomenon begins. And it spreads very, very quickly. Over the July 4th holiday that year, thousands of men and women contact authorities to report more than 850 sightings of UFOs. Right? Um, that's never been paralleled since. Right? There's never been such a frenzy of UFO sightings as there was over Independence Holiday. Uh, in 1947, although sightings remain fairly common through to the early 1950s, right? and you get um, 
pictures like this from New Jersey from 1952, alleging, uh, you know, a, a sighting of an un unidentified flying object. And unsurprisingly, you see a variety of efforts to try to explain this phenomenon. Two of the most influential voices in that process are Frank Scully and Donald Kehoe. Scully was a writer for Variety magazine who publishes Behind the Flying Saucers in 1950, where he really focuses in on the story of flying saucers that crash in the American Southwest. And where did that crash take place? Roswell. Not Roswell, but thank you for falling into my easy trap. <laughs> in fact, Scully says that they crash in Aztec, New Mexico. Um, neither Scully nor Kehoe ever mention Roswell. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit later about why that is. But Scully says sources crash in Aztec. And not only do sources crash, Scully says, but bodies are found. Three to four foot tall alien beings really cementing um, the modern idea of the little green man comes out of Scully's books. He also claims that the sources come not from Mars, but from Venus. Right? Um, and the 1950s are really kind of a key time in a Mars-Venus battle over where these flying saucers come from. Scully loses uh, popularity after 1952 because True magazine publishes an extensive article debunking his entire book, pointing out the fact that most of, or really all of Scully's sources are professional con men, and really just spending page after page making fun of Scully for believing the con men, and even making fun of how terrible Frank Scully's writing is. It's a really mean article. Um, and it destroys Scully's credibility. But Scully's ideas are going to have a really long shelf life. And actually just in recent years, there's been an uptick in people trying to uh, attract some of the Roswell tourism away over to Aztec and publishing new books saying that Scully was right and sources really did crash in Aztec, New Mexico. A little bit more kind of credible, at least at the time, than Scully is Donald Kehoe, uh, a retired officer from the Marine Corps who writes three very popular books. Uh, the Flying Sources Are Real, which is released in 1950. Flying Sources From Outer Space, which comes out in 1953. And The Flying Saucer Conspiracy in 1955. And Kehoe uh, reports conversations and interviews that he's purportedly had with Air Force officers, and specifically Air Force intelligence officers, um, to try and substantiate his warnings that, first of all, UFOs are real and military pilots are encountering them on a semi-regular basis. Second of all, he thinks there's a very good chance that the aliens have set up a mothership in orbit of Earth and that the UFOs are coming from that mothership rather than all the way from another planet. And thirdly, that these UFOs are most likely from Mars. Right? He's, he's not a Venus fan, he's back on the Mars train. And what's interesting about Kehoe is that he does see a conspiracy. He does see a conspiracy by the military to cover up the reality that Earth is being visited by these flying saucers. But he doesn't blame them for doing so. For Kehoe, uh, what he calls the silence group is acting out of a desire to protect national security and a desire to prevent public hysteria. 
And while he disagrees with that decision, he sees it as a matter of reasonable disagreement. He doesn't see nefarious motives at work. And that is um, an idea that is going to change significantly over the 60s and especially coming out of the 70s into the 80s. But it's really easy at the time to see the impact of writers like Kehoe who see a conspiracy of silence, but not necessarily a nefarious conspiracy of silence. Right, 1952, that same year that True Magazine is debunking Scully, Life Magazine leads with a big front cover splash of Marilyn Monroe and the headline, there is a case for interplanetary sources. And life comes down hard in that issue to say that they think something probably is going on with UFOs. Uh, less concerned with kind of credibility, but no less influential in putting these ideas into the American consciousness is the glut of alien invasion films in the 1950s. Of course, the classic invasion of the body snatchers, but also invasion of the saucer men, invaders from Mars, killers from space, Earth versus the flying saucers, and more. And there's a couple of interesting elements to be brought out from these films. Not the least of which is a lot of them deal with aliens either taking control of humans' minds or of replacing them entirely with simulacra, with lookalikes. And given that these are coming out mid to late 50s, what other fears have we been talking about that that kind of coincides with? Marissa? Yeah, certainly communist infiltration. Yeah, Carol? Um, brainwashing of Korean POWs. Brainwashing, good. Right? This is very much playing on two simultaneous fears bubbling up in the 1950s. Not just that the communists are infiltrating, but that the communists are infiltrating through this kind of mind control ideas. Um, and pairing that with this fear of extraterrestrial threat as well. And it really is an extraterrestrial threat. These films overwhelmingly buy in to a Donald Kehoe-style view of what's happening. The threat is purely extraterrestrial. It is not human. And in fact, most of these films, rather than the state being complicit or suspect, government agents, particularly military agents, are the heroes. They're the ones saving us from this extraterrestrial threat. So you have, yeah, Evelyn? Um, what is like the thought behind the motives of the aliens to like be a threat, like to attack um, us? Like, is there a thought of like why they're doing that? Yeah, the kind of the why of the conspiracy and attack. Um, there isn't really a single unifying idea in the 50s. Um, other than domination, right? The, the, the plan is always to conquer the world. Uh, why they want to conquer the world is open for interpretation. Is it because their own planet is dying? Is it because they want to kind of make us into slaves? Um, there's a pretty wide latitude there, but yeah, good question. So we see this kind of Kehoe-style um, opposite of paranoia at work to some extent. Right? Anybody remember our word for opposite of paranoia? Security? No. Yeah, but not quite, right? Security is kind of the middle line. Hope? Indifferent. Yeah, not quite. No? What do you call it when a conspiracy is acting for your good, not against you? Anybody remember that? No? Not paranoia, but pronoia. Right? This is very much an example of pronoid conspiracy thinking. 
And that's evident in um, another kind of thread of extraterrestrial phenomena that emerges in the 50s, which is an increasing number of people who claim that not only have they seen UFOs, but that they have been contacted by aliens. And this is really kicked off by a man called George Adamski. Uh, he's the first contactee to publish a book-length account of his experience in 1953. And Adamski contradicts virtually everything that has come before him. He says that they're not from Mars, they're from Venus. And if Scully's right about them being from Venus, he's wrong about them being short. He says they're about five foot six, they're humanoid, and they're very beautiful. And Adamski also says that they are not a threat. He says, the coming was friendly. Now Adamski is going to lose kind of popular support in the 60s after he claims that he will be leaving any day now for an interplanetary conference on Saturn and somehow never quite makes his appointment for that. But his ideas, his narrative, that there are these friendly visitors has very much caught on. And throughout the 1950s, you see this series of encounters with extraterrestrial beings who have seemingly come to warn humanity about our warlike nature, to warn us that nuclear weapons will destroy us all. A very pure distillation of common Cold War fears at the time. Um, Cold War fears also bearing no small resemblance to the 1951 film, The Day the Earth Stood Still, which is basically the exact same plot Adamski recounts two years later. Um, but nobody really picks Adamski off on this at the time. So there's still this pro noia at work in the early 50s, right? This idea that, yes, the government might be lying to us, but they're doing it for our own good, or yes, Aliens are visiting, but they're doing it for our own good. That increasingly is going to take a darker turn as we move out of the 50s into the 60s. And you start to see, not least, the government's motives and its methods become much darker in hiding the truth. And that's especially going to become symbolized by the idea of the men in black and the Men in Black is an idea that is really um, kind of more or less put into play by an author called Gray Barker. And Gray Barker is an interesting guy. Barker makes a pretty good living publishing books about supposedly true UFO encounters. But to friends, privately calls flying saucers a bucket of shit. So very much uh, capitalizing on this trend. But he's going to more or less launch this idea of the men in black in his 1956 book, They Knew Too Much About Flying Saucers, a book that's based on the experiences of a factory clerk from Connecticut, a man called Albert Bender, who claimed that uh, three men in black suits had approached him and intimidated him into not telling the truth uh, about his alien encounter. Um, now, obviously, Bender had not been that silenced, given that he, A, was able to tell Gray Barker about it, and B, publish his own book about it in 1962, in which he explains that it's not the Martians or the Venusians. In actual fact, he had been taken for a ride in a flying saucer to the South Pole by grisly, monster-like aliens from the planet Kazik, wherever that may be. Despite the, let's be generous and say skepticism with which we might greet Albert Bender's story, 
The idea that government agents and these sinister men in black are working to hide true information really gains popularity and it really takes off going through the 60s and 70s. And there's an interesting um, phenomenon going on with just the men in black themselves in that quite often they're characterized as altogether human agents of the state. But at the same time, they're often given many inhuman or unearthly characteristics. Characteristics that very often elide the difference between these scientific and supernatural explanations we've been talking about. And quite often, um, almost demonic powers are ascribed to the men in black. Uh, walking as though they are not of this earth, not blinking, unnatural powers of persuasion, even up to and including the idea that when they appear, an odor of sulfur also appears. Right? This very, very literal callback to folklore about demonic uh, appearance. The fact that traditionally they also appear in numbers of three, also heavily rooted in kind of mystical supernatural texts. And it's not just accounts of human action that take a darker turn as we move into the 60s. Increasingly, narratives of alien contact are going to turn away from friendly warnings about war into abduction and experimentation. And that really starts with a couple from New Hampshire, Betty and Barney Hill, who claim to have been abducted in 1961, um, although their uh, story doesn't really receive wide publicity until 1965. And the Hill's abduction is really going to set the template for all of the abduction narratives that come after. And looking at the spread of abduction conspiracism is really interesting, especially if we compare it to Kennedy conspiracism. Because like Kennedy conspiracism, this is very much a grassroots endeavor. Right? There's not somebody sitting behind their desk saying, this is what you all need to believe is the truth about what's going on. It's all of these people going out and trying to uncover the truth themselves. The difference being that in terms of abduction conspiracism, they're not detectives. They're not going out looking for evidence, right? They're not turning themselves into uh, experts on bullet trajectories. They themselves are the evidence. Their own abduction experience proves the truth of their conspiracy. Spencer? Do you feel that? these people are trying to uncover the truth or just trying to get like book deals? Because I feel like everyone is just, you, like I could make up a story and turn it into a public affair and get a lot of publicity from it. And mm -hmm. like, I don't know, do you have any idea what their motives, if they were really trying to uncover the truth or get some money or what? I mean, I think it's, um, it's really too complex of a question to have a single answer to, right? Not least because while there are certainly these criticisms labeled, uh, leveled against abductees or experiences, as they prefer to be called, um, while there are these accusations that they're just trying to profit, that they're trying to cash in and sell books, on the other hand, as Bridget Brown points us to, right, a lot of these people who come forward and say that they've been abducted, that is a socially devastating phenomenon. They're going to get cut off from groups of friends. They're going to be ostracized. They risk being fired from work. Um, so you can benefit from this, but you're really going to have to benefit from within the world of UFO abduction conspiracism. Matthew? Yeah, I feel like uh, one thing that question gets at is uh, the kind of theory of the paranoid style from mm -hmm. Hofstetter uh, doesn't seem to be enough to explain these kind of first-person encounters. Like we need, you know, it's unlike anything we've seen in any other conspiracies. Mm -hmm. um, so we need another kind of framework to understand. And, you know, it could be 
profit motive or it could be mental illness that was something that came up in the reading mm -hmm. and is there kind of a third prong to that kind of a, a different schema through which we can approach these people outside of um, they're either crazy or trying to make money um, I mean the third prong would be that they've been abducted by aliens I suppose right but, um, <coughs> And the problem is we're never really going to know for sure what their motivations are in this. But you're right, it is this um, fundamental difference between earlier conspiracism that we've talked about, where people are bearing the burden of this conspiracy themselves. It's their own direct experience. Right? Pearl Harbor conspiracists aren't saying that they flew the planes at Pearl Harbor. Um, Kennedy conspiracists aren't saying that they're the ones that took the shot. All right, I shouldn't say that. There are a couple of Kennedy conspiracists who do say they're the ones taking the shot. Um, but this is fundamentally different, where they're saying that they have been abducted. Devin? I think some of that could be a lack of verifiability. Mm -hmm. um, when you claim that it is your own narrative and that you were, in fact, abducted by aliens or what have you, there's no factual ground point. You know, in the mm -hmm. Kennedy assassination, you have X, Y, Z happened. Those are undisputed. You know, Kennedy was shot. You can't go mm -hmm. too far past that. Well, unless Whereas, there's somebody that says Kennedy's still alive, right? Right. Yeah. Or at least it looked like he was. Mm -hmm. Whereas, uh, in, I feel like in these, one of the rhetorically useful things about saying that it was your own experience is that nobody can really deny that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that is... At the root of why this, uh, why UFO conspiracism can become so expensive, right? Because we've talked about this. The fact that in terms of abduction evidence, that evidence is by definition personal. It is by definition subjective. And once we move away from the kind of objective veracity of physical evidence, what do we get to? What have we been talking about the last couple of classes? Distrust of the Yeah, but this kind of wider issue, right? We talked about it with Tink Thompson. Well, crisis of knowing that we can't ever know that it happened or that it didn't happen, so we're just kind of left with however we feel like interpreting the things that we personally were able to experience. Good. Mary, you want to jump on that? This sounds a lot like religion. So why are we so quick to discount UFOs when we base everything on this word of God and these personal experiences people in power have had? Okay, so to the extent that we talk about um, kind of mystical or angelic visitations, why do we accept those but discount UFO visitations? It's a good question. Um, some people combine the two. Some people say that UFOs are angelic visitors. Um, some people, or scholars, tend to say that they're coming from the same kind of place, right? That the people who are uh, saying that they were abducted now are the people who would have said that they were visited by angels several hundred years ago. But Devin, were you going to... I mean, one, one troubling thing is the numbers that you brought up earlier, like the 1947 spike after Kenneth mm -hmm. Arnold when 850 people all came forward mm -hmm. with alien stories. I mean, the, the likelihood that these trends of them all of a sudden being from Venus, all of a sudden being from Mars, mm -hmm. follow verifiable truth, especially when you can't follow it up with any physical evidence, mm -hmm. I think is uh, somewhat problematic. Yeah, certainly. Um, and it's inscribed into the name, right, as Matthew pointed us to before. They're literally called unidentified flying objects. And the problem is that all of these conspiracies are trying to inscribe them with meaning, are trying to identify something that is, by definition, unidentified. And so we do reach that same kind of point of crisis of knowing, as we've been talking about, that epistemological crisis. Uh, that Rumsfeldian mantra that we were talking about on Tuesday, right? that there are these known knowns, these known unknowns, and those unknown unknowns, the things you don't know that you don't know. And that's what's going to allow UFO conspiracism to be so expansive, because once you move away from the strictures of any physical evidence, pretty much anything is going to get into play. 
and pretty much anything is going to come into play. But still, the fact that there is this wide latitude of where these conspiracies could go, the fact that they tend to track within these trends would seem to suggest something to us about how they're being shaped by their historical context. Right? For example, these abduction narratives. The fact that as they are refined and revised over the following years by authors like Whitley Strieber, that they become ever more um, focused on medical experimentation and increasingly focused on graphic and explicit sexual violation. And scholars like Brown draw a direct link between the kind of evolution of these abduction narratives and changing anxieties over sexual and reproductive um, sociologies and technologies. Right? The fact that these abduction narratives start around the time that new forms of contraception are coming into play, around the time that new forms of sexual liberation are coming into play. The fact that increasingly these abduction narratives focus on reproductive experimentation after the Roe v. Wade decision in the 70s, and especially in line with the culture wars over abortion in the 80s. Like there's a separation between people who like look into this as a sort of like or as a conspiracy or as like an interest versus like the issue of how it relates to religion and the fact that it almost has like a basis in science and like like studying like extraterrestrials are here to study us. Mm -hmm. They're not here to like I don't know like save us or like take us back to their planet or mm -hmm. something like that. But they're here to like in this case, like, study reproductive, like, systems of humans or, like, take over your brain or something mm -hmm. like that. Like, is that kind of, like, the opposite? Like, to me, it seems like kind of the opposite side of religion because, like, okay. people who look at this kind of can say that there's a basis of scientific evidence or scientific, maybe not evidence, but, mm -hmm. like, theory behind it. That there is a rational motive behind yeah. why... Instead of just like an, uh, like an angel flying through the air, like this mm -hmm. is a machine made by beings who have the intelligence to make a machine art coming with like a motive to like learn about humans. Mm -hmm. Certainly, although you could make a fairly good argument that although they're supernatural, angels or divine providence would usually have had a rational reason behind why they were coming into play as well. Evelyn, you want to jump? My thought about the relationship between the belief in aliens and religion is that I think that it has to do with the need to believe in something bigger than yourself and bigger than like what we have going on here mm -hmm. um, on Earth. And I think that a lot of people who become religious after something bad has happened is because they're looking for reassurance or mm -hmm. they are needing to believe that like everything happens for a reason. And I think that you can apply that logic to the belief in aliens that like things that are happening or that people think they're hap are happening mm -hmm. are because something else exists. Mm -hmm. And that phrase there, right? Everything happens for a reason. We've talked about before as one of these kind of founding mantras of conspiracism, that everything happens within a conspiracy for a reason, that it is part of a plan. And in kind of a divine providential version of that. It's happening because of God's plan. In a uh, you know, enlightenment rationalist view of that, it's happening because of a human or, in this case, extraterrestrial agency. That there is a plan, that there is something happening. Anna? I still think that there's a difference there because in terms of like God's plan that is completely centered around humans mm -hmm. um, and like yeah and like and like earth and if you're looking at extraterrestrials you're recognizing that there is another planet with a community with a population of other beings mm -hmm. and like other life and other realities besides just human reality mm -hmm. and I feel like the idea of God 
like, and God's plan has to do with only a human reality. So, like, that would bring in different kind, like, response to, like, something happening, either looking to God or looking to aliens would mm-hmm. be a, two different narratives. Matthew? Uh, yeah, I think, though, you know, uh, alien conspiracies are similar to only, like, a very particular type of religion. Mm-hmm. Like, uh, you know, most religious people, I think, are similar to the way most of us think that, or said that we thought aliens might be out there somewhere past mm-hmm. where we can see. And for religion, the past where we can see just happens to be after death, not outside the range of our telescopes. Mm-hmm. Um, the alien conspiracies we've talked about are more similar to like the premillennialists that we discussed mm-hmm. before, where you know it starts extending into where we can see or we ought to be able to see mm-hmm. if this conspiracy weren't you know muddying the waters or obscuring things. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and there are um, as we hopefully we'll get to we'll see. Um, there are people who make an explicit connection there as well. There is an, um, there are those who make a explicit linkage between this uh, evangelical premillennial dispensationalism and extraterrestrials, uh, usually folding extraterrestrials in as agents of Satan, as agents of the Antichrist within those kind of prophecies. Um, and these are, these are interesting questions, right? And they're big questions um, that, unfortunately, I don't think we're going to be able to answer today. Um, but the, that relationship between uh, extraterrestrial visitation and supernatural religious visitation is intimately intertwined. Um, and these supernatural elements, these otherworldly elements, are key parts of these abduction narratives, these alien narratives. Um, but it's not just religious narratives that are playing into this as well. Right? Um, these narratives have strong elements of Native American captivity narratives from the 17th, 18th centuries, right? Uh, fears of white colonists, particularly of uh, white female colonists being abducted and held captive by Native Americans. Um, in terms of their kind of sexual content, the almost pornographic detail that these abduction narratives go into, there's a significant rhetorical debt owed to um, the anti-Catholic escaped nun narratives of the 19th, early 20th centuries, uh, some of which we saw advertised in those clan newspapers that we were looking at. Right? Um, so there's a lot of different elements coming into this. Uh, not just sexual anxieties as well, anxieties about race. The fact that the first abducted couple is an interracial couple is not unrelated. The fact that one of the major fears in the 60s as um, interracial marriage is ruled legal by the Supreme Court, the fact that this, these fears of miscegenation are very, very present even as alien abduction stories present new fears of interspecies sex, those are not unrelated elements. And you have this kind of really interesting um, conflation, as Brown points to, between the kind of individual body of the abductee, of the experiencer, and of the national body, of the citizenry as a whole, who is being violated by this conspiracy. Um, And it is increasingly a conspiracy. It is something in which the government is complicit in. Um, it's also worth talking, just very briefly, related to that question of race, um, there's a really odd kind of eugenicist element that plays into alien uh, abduction theories coming out through the 70s, 80s, 90s as well. And whilst there's this kind of huge taxonomy of alien races that gets constructed, there's really kind of three key races, races, species, whatever you want to call them. One of which is the Plodeans, who are described as benevolent and loving and beautiful uh, and highly evolved and spiritual. Anybody want to guess what 
the Pleiadians are meant to look like? Caucasians. Caucasians? Any specific kind of Caucasians? Blonde, blue eyed. Blonde, blue eyed, right? They are incredibly Aryan. Um, in fact, they are commonly refer referred to as tall Nordics. Uh, Nordic itself being a term of eugenicist taxonomy coming out of the early 20th century, as opposed to, you know, those lower class southern Europeans who can't be counted as being as racially superior as the Nordics. And you see the short grey as the kind of um, equivalent of southern Europeans to some extent in this taxonomy. Um, the short grey whose description owes a debt to those little green men, right, to the movies of the 50s, to Frank Scully um, explanations, but whose popular appearance culture is really cemented by Betty and Barney Hill again. Right? Not only do they set the template for the abduction narrative, they set the idea of what the big-headed grey alien with the big eyes looks like and really cements that within the popular consciousness. Um, the other big kind of grouping of uh, alien species within these taxonomies are our old friends, the reptilians, right? or um, to give them their UFO conspiracy name, the draconians, uh, who are these tall lizard people who are probably hiding amongst us, plotting to take over the earth at any time. Uh, anybody remember? the English conspiracist we've talked about before who's particularly focused in on these conspiracists, uh, particularly focused in on these reptilians? Anna? I, I don't remember that, but I did read something recently okay. that popped up uh, saying that someone had seen Justin Bieber turning into his reptilian form in the uh -huh. airport. Uh, a few weeks ago, <laughs> and Excellent. that he, he is a secret uh, giant lizard. That he is also one of them. Yes. Yeah. Which I had never heard before. Very talented for <laughs> Yeah. Well, lizard people are everywhere, Matthew. We can't discount this. Um, especially if you ask David Icke, right? He's the English conspiracist that we talked about on our very first day of class, um, who is thoroughly an advocate of the idea that the lizard people are the queen, the president, virtually everybody in high office. Uh, anybody remember what Ike thinks that they do? How do they survive? They drink the blood of uh, blonde people, basically. Right, they drink blood, and they don't just drink blood, they drink the blood of blonde-eyed, uh, blonde-eyed, blue-eyed, blonde-haired children, of these Aryan children, right? Um, so again, there are, they are this specific racial threat um, and containing these kind of deep elements of anti-Semitic blood libel myths as well. Sergi, were you going to? Yeah, I was going to ask, is there a, I, wouldn't, I don't know if it's a conspiracy theory, but a theory on, since they're described as draconians feeding on Aryan-like children, would it also be that they were feeding on Pladeans? Pladean children? Um, Aryan-looking children are children of Pladeans? Well, all right, now we're getting into the deep weeds. Depending on who you ask, the Pladeans and the Draconians may be working together in conjunction with the secret rulers of the state. On the other hand, they may be engaged in a secret millennia-long war. Um, on the other hand, we may be the descendants of the Pladeans. On the other hand, the reptilians may have traveled back in time to create us, to create a food source for themselves. Uh, which is to say, virtually any answer is possible to your question. Because as we've established, right, with this epistemological crisis, with this divorce from physical evidence, virtually any conspiracy theory is possible. And those conspiracy theories are increasingly going to make the government complicit. And an excellent example of that is Roswell. Allegedly, flying saucer crashes in Roswell in 
July 1947, right on trend with our other UFO sightings. And because it's surrounded by this wealth of other UFO sightings, and because uh, the Air Force pretty quickly declares the wreckage that's found in Roswell to be that of a weather balloon, the media moves on. There are hundreds more UFO sightings to report on. And it's not until the boom in UFO conspiracism coming out of the late 1970s that Roswell really regains attention in conspiracist circles. Um, so we talked about this a little bit on uh, Tuesday. Why might we see a boom in conspiracism and it's particularly anti-government conspiracism in the late 70s? Marissa? You have of um, COINTELPRO, chaos, and just all these things that are coming out, the church committee. Mm -hmm. So it's just a lot of like operations that the public didn't know about that are now in the public. Mm -hmm. Good, right? We've got Watergate, we've got the church committee, all these revelations of CIA misdeeds, MKUltra, um, right? Lending even more credence to the idea of secret medical experimentation going on. And there is a very kind of explicit linkage being made in the late 70s between this post-Watergate era and a boom in uh, alien conspiracism and particularly abduction conspiracism. Uh, you see the establishment of Citizens Against UFO Secrecy in 1977, an organization dedicated to using Freedom of Information Act requests to get the government to reveal the truth about UFOs, which is almost beautifully naive, right? The fact that you think the government is planning this huge conspiracy, but that because the law is on your side, you can still get them to reveal those secrets. It's a, it's a really nice sentiment, I always find. Um, but not only does Citizens Against UFO Secrecy come along, but a uh, nuclear physicist turned ufologist called Stanton Friedman, rediscovers Roswell. And we don't want to draw kind of overly uh, simplistic links between this post-Watergate um, national uh, concern and this boom in Roswell conspiracism, but sometimes the researchers themselves make that subtext text. Stanton Friedman explicitly says Roswell is a cosmic Watergate. Right? Um, other rival researchers like Don Schmidt describe the Kennedy assassination as a formative experience and compare the government's statements on Roswell to the Warren Commission report. Right? In neither case can this official document be trusted. Uh, Philip Corso, who writes the really popular The Day After Roswell, is a firm advocate of the two Oswalds theory of the Kennedy assassination um, and goes further than that to say that the entire Cold War was really just a cover to help develop anti-alien uh, defense mechanisms. And you see this flood of Roswell literature through the 80s, through the 90s, that says, yes, the government covered it up. And they didn't do it for our own good. Donald Kehoe was wrong. Instead, it is a litany of misinformation and misdeeds. No longer is the Air Force this benign body trying to protect uh, the public from national hysteria. Now, President Truman sets up Magic 12 in 1947 as a special government body to cover up the truth about UFOs, uh, presumably also in charge of those men in black. Right? And this reaches kind of such a um, crisis point that in 1994, the Air Force actually releases a report about Roswell, a thousand pages long. Um, and you can still find this, as I pulled it off for today, on the DOD website. This is still very easily publicly available. And the Air Force says, okay, actually we did lie to you about it being a weather balloon. 
In actual fact, it's the wreckage from Project Mogul, which was a top secret project to try to uh, detect long range Soviet nuclear uh, experiments. So that's good, right? That comes out, all of the Roswell conspiracy theorists say, brilliant, now it's cleared up, we can move on. No? No, it doesn't tend to work that way. Uh, the government coming out and saying that we've been lying to you for almost 50 years, but now we're telling you the truth, doesn't convince an awful lot of these conspiracy theorists. Um, in much the same way that the Pearl Harbor inquiry just spurs more conspiracy theories, in much the same way that the Warren Commission just spurs more conspiracy theories. The Air Force's Roswell report just spurs more conspiracy theories. It's not helped by the CIA also coming out in 1997 and saying, we've also been lying to you, and we lied to you about the UFO sightings. You did see stuff, but it was top secret military planes and we couldn't tell you. Sorry, but UFOs still aren't real. We didn't have exactly the same impact. Um, saying that you've been lying for years is not going to build public uh, trust that you're now telling the truth. And so over this kind of course of the 80s and 90s, as this Roswell conspiracism specifically develops and this abduction conspiracism more generally develops, you really see it move into not mainstream acceptance, but mainstream recognition. Right? Nobody came to class today never having heard of Roswell. Nobody came to class today having never seen a picture of a short gray alien with a big head and big eyes. And it's really very um, strongly at the forefront of popular consciousness in the 90s. And you get best-selling paperbacks that get turned into high-rated TV shows, right? The truth about Roswell gets turned into a Showtime show. You get the classic tabloid covers. Weekly World News is all over the Clinton-alien relationship in the 90s. Um, there is even, at some point, intimations that Bill Clinton has another sex scandal, but this time with an extraterrestrial intern. Um, and of course, television. Right? There's a reason why The X-Files comes along in the 90s, because it is the kind of pop cultural culmination of a lot of these trends that we've been talking about. And the fact that these trends become so uh, prominent within mainstream discourse is also going to open up room at the fringes for even more esoteric conspiracies to develop. Matthew, you know? uh, Scully from the X-Files, is that a throwback to uh, Scully who the... Um, to Frank Time Scully? True Magazine, yeah. Yes, piece was about. very okay. much so, yeah. Um, there's a lot of kind of these references back in this. The, the creators of the X-Files are very well steeped in this law <laughs> when they come along. Um, also very well steeped in this law are people like William Cooper, who releases Behold a Pale Horse in 1991. And Behold a Pale Horse is a really odd book in many ways. Not least the fact that Cooper doesn't just believe virtually every conspiracy theory we've talked about today, he believes virtually every conspiracy theory we've talked about all semester. Um, and because if you believe in a conspiracy, that conspiracy is in this book, it makes the book very, very popular and very, very influential among conspiracist circles um, and amongst a wide variety of conspiracist circles. Right? Uh, Cooper's book is popular with the Patriot or Militia movement in the 90s. Timothy McVeigh is a fan of Behold a Pale Horse. But also, it's really popular in the hip-hop fan community and the idea that you know, Jay-Z is an Illuminati mastermind. Right? These kind of very disparate communities unite behind holding William Cooper's Behold a Pale Horse in high regard. And part of that is how all-encompassing Cooper's narrative is. And it has to be all-encompassing because he has a very direct philosophy. As he writes, 
I do not believe in fate. I do not believe in accidents. I cannot and will not accept the theory that long sequences of unrelated accidents determine world events. Remind us of anything? Devon? Mechanistic causality. Bingo. Right. Cooper is a excellent example of that idea of mechanistic causality, of that idea that Evelyn brought up before, right? that there has to be a reason. For Cooper, everything happens for a reason. There is no contingency. There is no accident. Which means that when the question of extraterrestrial life comes along, it also is going to have to be folded into his grand conspiracist narrative. And Cooper's uh, bete noir, as with a lot of modern conspiracists, is the Bilderberg group, right? that shadowy group that supposedly convenes once a year and is the secret puppet master's council of the world. Um, listen to Alex Jones for more than about 10 minutes on any given day, and it's almost a guarantee you're going to get to the Bilderberg group pretty quickly. Um, very much a foundational element of the kind of new world order conspiracism that takes hold in the 90s. And Cooper's a key player in that. For Cooper, the Bilderberg group is founded in 1947. Why? What's happening in 1947? The Manhattan Project is mostly done by that point. Uh, the year of the Roswell crash. Year of the Roswell crash. Year of all of the UFO sightings, right? For Cooper, the Bilderberg Group is created in direct reaction to the extraterrestrial uh, threat. For Cooper, though, Magic Twelve isn't created to cover up the truth about UFOs. He says that Friedman and others like him are actually government disinformation agents. In fact, what he says is Majesty 12 is created to establish relations with these aliens. And Cooper goes further. He says that by 1954, President Eisenhower is going to sign a treaty with the aliens that says, look, you want to come along and um, experiment on humans, that's fine. We'll look the other way. We'll even build secret bases for you to do so, like Area 51. But in return, we want secret advanced technologies. Um, the two most commonly pointed to being beam weapons and time travel, um, which apparently the US has had hold of since 1954. So, um, what they're doing with it, I don't know, um, but apparently they do have it. In case anybody's wondering, according to Cooper, the alien ambassador's name is his most on omnipotent highness, Krill. Um, so even in alien ambassadorships, the patriarchy still holds sway, apparently. And only one US president, according to Cooper, is willing to challenge this threatening alliance with the aliens. Anybody want to take a guess as to which heroic president is willing to stand up to this? JFK. Of course, JFK. Right? Once again, we see conspiracists inscribing the Kennedy death with its own meaning. Again, a form of counterfactual history coming into play. Whereas Oliver Stone's counterfactual history says that if Kennedy had lived, he'd have pulled us out of Vietnam. Cooper's counterfactual history says that if he had lived, he would have revealed the truth about the aliens um, and also about the fact that the CIA controls the world drug markets to fund the secret alliance with the aliens. And also the fact that Eisenhower was actually working for Rockefeller, who was actually part of the Council on Foreign Relations, who was actually working for the Illuminati, which was actually part of the Bilderberg Group and working in conjunction with uh, European royalists and, as always, the Catholics. Um, Anna? So are there thoughts that aliens are behind JFK's assassination to keep it quiet? 
Very much so. Um, if you take uh, Cooper's telling, then he may have been alien, he may have been human, but either way, it's the driver of Kennedy's car who actually kills Kennedy um, and does so in order to silence him on this question of the alien conspiracy. Um, as you might tell from that, there's a kind of heavily religious element here as well, right? the anti-Catholic element, because where's he getting behold a pale horse from? Revelation. From Revelations. Right, good. Again, he's strongly fitting in, as Matthew pointed us to earlier, within this um, strain of premillennial dispensationalist apocalypticism. He is one of those who strongly believe that aliens are probably satanic agents and are playing their own part in bringing about the end times. He also folds in ideas of medical and eugenic conspiracism. Um, going back to Evelyn's question as to why, why are the aliens taking us, why are they uh, experimenting on us, Cooper's argument is that aliens' genetic structure is deteriorating and they need to experiment on our superior genetic structure in order to save the, the alien race, which is a really interesting turnabout, right, where you say these beings from another planet who've traveled however far to get here are still racially inferior to us. There's a weird racial supremacism at work there um, that in some way echoes the kinds of racial supremacism we saw with Pearl Harbor, that we saw with the loss of China. The idea that America couldn't possibly have lost to these inferior races Instead, there must be complicity from within that allows this conspiracy to take hold, that allows America to be handed this defeat. Um, so Cooper very much operating within those strains as well. And while we roll our eyes, as I think we've all rolled our eyes talking about Cooper, he is massively influential, not least in New World Order militia conspiracism. And we talked about the fact it's no coincidence that abduction narratives coincide with new uh, reproductive uh, technological and social anxieties. It's no coincidence that Cooper and New World Order conspiracism both emerge in the 90s. And there is a strong linkage between the two. And that's not to say that the two forms of conspiracism map perfectly onto each other. But a lot of the tropes that we see in New World Order conspiracism, the men in black, the black helicopters, the secret bases, these are all tropes that are drawn from UFO conspiracism. And William Cooper is really one of the key linkages there, giving birth to this new form of um, extraterrestrial conspiracism that we seem to be working our way through now. Because if you know, anybody has noticed, not a lot of people are talking about alien abduction anymore. Right? Alien abduction narratives have kind of fallen off. It seems to have been a late 20th century phenomenon rather than an early 21st century phenomenon. And instead, as Bridget Brown points us to, we're more and more seeing the dark side hypothesis in play. These new fears of an alien-human alliance that is deeply reflective of contemporary fears of terrorism, of state sovereignty, and of the national security state. All right, unfortunately, we are out of time, so we will leave it there. We're gonna pick up with some of these threads on Tuesday, particularly these ideas about structures of race and conspiracism. So have a good weekend, and I will see you then. Thanks for listening to C-SPAN's Lectures in History, one of nine C-SPAN podcasts available on our website. You can find them all by going to c-span.org slash podcasts or on our C-SPAN radio app.